The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Alliance Australia Life Insurance Limited, ABN 27076 033 782, AFSL 296 559, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hello everyone, my name is Jamie McIntyre, Director and Financial Planner at Mac Financial in Geelong. I love being part of the financial planning profession and in particular helping people build and enjoy their wealth. Together with the Ensemble team, we have put together a retirement podcast series to dig into the retirement advice space. I hope you enjoy and pick up some great ideas in today's episode. At Allianz Retire Plus, we believe that all Australians should be able to live their lives with certainty and not have to worry about tomorrow's what-ifs, market volatility, or whether they have enough money for the future. That's why we're committed to delivering innovative retirement income solutions with a guaranteed income for life. We're proud to be part of the Allianz family that's been helping Australians for over 100 years. With Allianz Retire Plus, it all adds up to certainty. Hello to everyone and welcome to episode three of the Ensemble Retirement Podcast Series. In today's podcast, we are going to discuss how to help clients discover and find new purpose when they move into retirement. My name is Jamie McIntyre and I will be your host of today's podcast. I'm a financial planner and I specialize in helping clients plan for retirement and have the retirement that they want. Our guest today or my guest today is Liam Short of Sonus Wealth. Sonus Wealth is Irish for prosperity and good fortune. Liam and I share a focus of helping people achieve greater wealth. Liam is a family wealth advisor and SMSF consultant. Liam and I will discuss our experiences when helping clients transition into retirement. In our chat today, we will uncover ways we have both helped clients figure out what is important to them, what they want from their retirement, and ways we have helped them find a new purpose in retirement. Moving from working life to non-working life is a significant change for people to navigate. Liam, welcome to today's podcast. Hi, glad to be on there. Um, Liam, let's kick off today by talking about the stages that clients go through as they move into retirement and tell me what are some of the key stages you see that clients need to work through to prepare for the retirement that they want. Yeah, so one of the first things is deciding how and when they're going to retire. So more and more we're we're seeing people who are actually transitioning into retirement by cutting down their hours, um, you know, maybe doing a nine day fortnight and then down to an eight day fortnight. And and you're cutting right back to maybe two or three days a week before they actually do the full retirement. And that's often, you know, tied in with using up their long service leave. So it's it's not a bad way to just try retire try before you buy the retirement uh, uh, experience. Um and it's it's certainly good for people who've have just worked full on all their lives to be able to not just have a clean finish, but to actually transition themselves out slowly, sort of wean themselves off work. Yeah, and that's it. That's the experience that we have with most clients. It's um, I I think historically for blue collar workers, they would work really hard, um, go to work every day and be really really tired and want to retire really quickly. But I think today we've got well a different workforce um, for one, and and people are are physically able to work for longer, and and they're doing as you say the transition across um, reducing their days over time and and getting themselves ready for retirement. And I suppose finding that new purpose, Liam. Yeah, so um, that's a big thing. You know, you, you're you probably seven, eight hours a day at work and maybe, you know, one to two hours commuting a day. So you're, you're looking at about nine hours a day that you've got to fill in retirement. Now, depending on the type of job you ha- you've had, you, you may struggle um, in finding what to do. You know, some people had really demanding roles and, you know, they, they, they were using their brain really, you know, on, on constantly through the day and then it was taxing. And then they, they go into retirement and they suddenly find themselves with, with no such challenges. They haven't planned. So they find themselves at home going, well, what's, what's my purpose in life? I used to be so important. I used to, everything used to rely on me and now it doesn't. So what we talk about to people like that is they really need to plan their retirement more than somebody who has already, you know, sort of got hobbies, they've got interests, 
they've got things that they you know their whole life doesn't resolve revolve around their work. And um, those people they fit into retirement a, a lot better than somebody who's you know that hundred percent committed to their job and and it's an intensive job. So it's a, it's a lot about making sure that those people think maybe five years out from retirement exactly what do they want retirement to look like and start planning for then um, rather than just having that, that you know cold finish and um, and not not being sure what to do because that has led to depression from what I've seen. And uh, look, you make uh, a, a quite a few interesting points uh, with what you just spoke about. Let's let's start with focusing on. Um, you mentioned five years out from retirement, um, which seems to me, in my experience, to be a, a good lead time to start preparing for, well, the significant change that's going to occur in their life from um, being needed at work um, to, you know, finding something to fulfill that in retirement. So let's go back five years, Liam, um, and, and one of those sorts of things that um, pre-retirees should be focused on. Well, focused on things like if they're planning to to move house, you know, what sort of house is going to suit them in retirement? So, you know, I, I hear a lot of people talking about downsizing, but, you know, I've got a number of clients who are car enthusiasts. Um, so, yes, they wanted to downsize, but they still wanted a big garage. So for, for you know, people like that, what, for some of them, what we decided was the best option was, yes, downsize, but also buy themselves a little industrial unit. That, that they can use as their, their little mechanics yard and storage for their cars. Um, for others, it's it's a revol- revolves around committing to, um, you know, mining grandchildren and things like that. So we're we're telling people to be you know be really careful about that because mining your grandchildren it's could be a ten to twelve hour day, and in your sixties or seventies that can be a fairly demanding, um, you know, ask on your on your body and on your your mental capacity. So we, we sort of said you don't overcommit to those sort of uh, things with your 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 children and grandchildren, ease into it and try and make sure there's still me time in retirement. For a, a lot of men, it's a case of the, the natural thing is, oh, there's loads of things for me to fix around the house. Well, sorry, but normally they're finished within the first thirty days, or or else they go on the never never. So you've you've got to really start looking at things like, is there an association like yeah, Probus or Rotary that are you know men's shed that they're, they're brilliant for for older people. But also, you know, the hobbies, you can, people say golf, but you can, you're not going to play golf five days a week. So it's really trying to figure out, you know, what are the things you will focus on? And, it, you know, things like travel, I, I found it's a great experience for, for for men, especially to take over the responsibility for um, planning trips overseas. You know, where are you going to stay, what cars you're going to um, hire and stuff like that. That really gets them engaged. In, and I tell wives to, to give that responsibility to their husbands so that they're more likely to want to travel, you know. If if they just say I want, you know, let's let's travel, a lot of the men will just say oh, I can't be I can't be bothered. And um, but if they're actually involved in the planning and the actual logistics of it, they're much more likely to to go on a, a trip. Yeah, absolutely. I, look, we we consider it from, or I consider it from, from three key things that we focus on having discussions on. Um, one of those is their social need. Uh, the other ones their physical need and the third one is the emotional need and what ties around all of those is the financial need as well you, you mentioned from a social perspective uh, a men's shed or you know something to connect uh, you with a new group of people once you leave work um, and I think that's a great example of, of an option um, another option is playing golf or lawn bowls um, they're the, I think they're the common ones that everyone refers to, but I mean, Liam, in my experience, not everyone likes golf or lawn bowls. Mm. Yeah, um, look, there's there's opportunities out there, you know, volunteering with charities, um, you know, with uh, groups like Helping Hand who supply you know food food baskets to people. There's there's all sorts of stuff out there. So you know, I give a little book to to clients when they're turning sixty, and it's 101 things for your husband to do in retirement. And I give that to the wives to give as a present to their husbands because, look, I find that most women do already have a purpose. They know exactly what they want to do in retirement. Or if they don't, they ask their friends and they talk. Women talk among themselves and they give each other ideas. Men are not so good at talking about things like that. So that's where thing, you know, uh, places like the men's shed are really good. Um, so you, you just get in there, playing around with the tools, and you just end up talking to people. 
Whereas if you, the men are not going to sit around a, a, a cafe table and have a coffee and, and open up about themselves. So it's got to be getting into those groups that where they just start the conversations naturally and build up relationships with other people to replace those relationships they had at work previously. Um, you know, I had one client who had a very taxing, demanding job. Um, when he went into retirement, he did cycling, he did motorbiking, you know, he did, uh, you know, in Thailand, Vietnam, he did road trips in, in Italy. And then he came back to me after about two years of retirement and said, I'm, I'm totally depressed. He said, everything I'm doing is physical and it's great and it's brilliant, but nothing's taxing my mind. And so, you know, we sat down with him, we went through a few things and in the end, the challenge for him was we, we got him to learn French. We took on a you know a one-on-one French speaker, learned French, it did really immerse himself in it. And uh, the goal was then the next year to spend three months in France with his wife in, in just a French village and be self-sustainable. Um, that just, it just changed his attitude completely. He went, he dove full lent into it. Um, they had a great, I think they ended up saying about five months in France the following year. And now he's he's looking at Spanish. You know, he's he, he just he's looking for that next mental challenge to keep him uh, alive. And uh, you know, the social aspect of when they did go to France, it was a case of he had to go out. He had to meet everybody in the local community. So it was just engaging him and keeping his mind active. It was brilliant for him. What a great story, Liam. Um, I think there's a perception which which is also changing. Is your financial planner is there to figure out the money only? Um, but really it's about figuring out the drivers for living life that money fulfills as well, isn't it? Yeah. And, and also me, money can be a burden. So a lot of people have worked really hard all their lives to, to, to put money away. They've done salary sacrifice. They've done everything to build up this nest egg. And a lot of the financial planners job nowadays is, is sort of giving them permission to actually spend that money without worrying because they, they just feel that, they've, that there's always something over the horizon that they're going to need the money for. Well, as a financial planner, our job is to go, look, you can sustainably spend this amount a year um, and it's not going to run out. Or you, you know, if something comes up and they come and say, oh, look, I want to do the the um, the, the mountaineer across the Rockies in Canada, but it's going to be 25,000. You know, it's a matter of, for financial planners then just looking at the finances and going, if it's not going to make a huge difference, then you're really empowering them to, to to make that decision because I keep on saying to people, I don't have any clients in their 80s that turn around and say, I regret that I went to Europe or I regret that I went around Australia in a caravan, but I've got heaps of them that say, I wish we hadn't put it off. I wish we'd done it earlier. Um, so it, it's a case of part of the, the role of the financial planner, especially that big change from 60 to 70 from your know, working to retirement is, is is showing people that they can spend sustainably and not fear of running out of money. Yeah, I'd agree with that. The Generally, when they come to us or if they're already working with us, um, I, the one of the greatest fears is the income tap that they are used to or that is normal for them, which is a salary or a profit share for their business. Um, that tap's going to turn off. That's part of the decision that's being made when you retire. And it's about them understanding what comes out of the other tap, right? The first fear is around money, I experience. And it, you meet with clients when you're starting to map this out. And, gen- and, and for us, we, we always meet with the husband and wife. And part of that is a little bit of what you spoke about before, that men won't tend to open up to Ben um, and and with um, the, the wife's present, we, we can dig a bit deeper and, and find out together what they both want and bring them together. Yeah, and, and um, to be more realistic about what how much they actually need because in a lot of cases, the wives have run the, the, the budget of the household and so they've got a better idea of what the basic costs are. Uh, a lot of these, you know, so you know, when you sit down with them, it's, it's important to also understand how their income comes at the moment while they're working and you know, so, for example, if somebody's as simple as if they were paid fortnightly um, while they were working, can we replace it with a fortnightly pension uh, in retirement from their pensions? Um, and showing them, as you said, where the money's going to come from. So some of it may come from their income streams. Some may come from investments outside. Um, and some may come from Centrelink support as well. And just showing them how all those play together 
to deliver their target income so that they don't have to worry about, oh, yeah, am I going to have to sell down stuff just to fund my, my lifestyle? If you know, That's where we play around the bucket strategy of saying, look, we want to have at least two to three years money in cash and term deposits so that you never have to think about where the next year's money is coming. And that leaves you with the rest of the money can be invested longer term to, to do its best. But it's that comfort of knowing that there's two to three years money in cash fixed interest and, and bonds that you are fairly secure. So it and you know that's basically their their rock and their their core retirement uh, funding, so that they don't have to worry about where that next next pension payment is going to come from. Yeah, I think he makes some really good points. There is is a part of that transition is keeping some things the same, which is you know looking for ways to for them to pay themselves from their retirement um, assets in a fortnightly way, if that's something they were used to. So. So trying to minimize that disruption for them. Let's let's circle into, you know, finding purpose. So so they need to understand what money they have. They need to understand what income they are likely to need. And there's a body of work from a we'll call it from a financial planning perspective and cash flow modeling and things like that. But tell me, Liam, what what sort of questions or, or, or how do you dig deep enough to understand their purpose and, and what I would call their real goals? Most come with a fear that they don't have a, enough money and they'll they'll talk to you about, oh, can I maybe afford one international holiday before I die, for example? Um, tell me how you go about digging deeper into what they really want and, and really to get underneath a bit more around purpose in retirement. Yes, yeah, so- it Look, a lot of it's just it's just asking questions and, and, and listening, you know, really understanding. And, and that's why you talked about having the couple there. It is really important to have both of them there, get both of their inputs, because I know a lot of people who all they've done is waited for retirement to go on uh, on big overseas holidays. And, and yet they haven't understood that their partner's not interested in that. Their partner may be interested in going fishing or, you know, doing art or, you know, doing a, doing a language. Um, and it's just trying to identify, you know, what the actual goals are for each of them. What are the combined goals? And then also maybe saying to them, look, it's not it's not greedy to say you also want some me time to do your own thing, you know, to to go all you know, for, for a bloke to go off and, and work on a car. You know, it it may annoy his wife that he's he's worked all his life and he comes home and then he's in the he's in the garage. Um, but if they've talked about that and they've agreed that two days a, a week that's that's his passion, that's what he's going to do. But that. She wants his she wants his time, you know, for something else, and maybe she wants to go and do some art, or she wants to go and, uh, you know, I've got a lot of women who go in walking groups and, um, you know, just discussion groups, book clubs with with friends. They don't want their husband shadowing them and stuff like that. So it's really agreeing that yes, it's time to be together in retirement, but there's no shame or it's not greedy to want some of your own me time. And what we said to what we do find is some men who don't want to travel. We've said to their, their wives, well, go with a sister, go with your mother, go with a friend on, on travel. You know, don't make it a, a barrier to you achieving your goals just because your husband doesn't want to. Just agree between you that you have these other separate purposes that you want, things that you want to do in retirement um, that may not involve your, your partner. And to, to be honest, we are seeing also a rise in the great divorce where it, it just doesn't work out. And then you know, it's often it's only on retirement that they realise that they they don't want to be together in retirement, and it's talking you know talking them through that sort of situation if that happens. Yeah, it's um, and that does happen. Um, we've experienced that as well. Um, I, I think to to not so much to sum up that conversation, but what I heard you talking about, and it's circling back to a word you used earlier, which is the word permission. Um, I think uh, the husband, the wife, or, or whomever is sitting in front of you is is looking for permission to do the new things that are going to happen in their life when they have that significant change of one or both spouses, you know, stopping working eight hours a day where they, they were entertained, I suppose, independently in the, in those time frames. Um, so I think I think I circle back to that word permission, and it's really important for us as the planners to work through those layers of permission and, and bring it all together, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, the the funding of it then comes into it. You know, if if somebody's got you know ideas of you know being an absolute 
spending a fortune on something. It's it's dragging them back and going saying, you know, reasonably, your 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 budget can afford to do this, but you you, you need to pull in pull the reins on some of your your ambitions because it's just not possible. So it, it it is a tough conversation to have with people sometimes, but in most cases, I find that they actually have the money to do these things. Um, it's just it's a reluctance to spend anything is the problem, not spending too much. Um, and you know, I've got plenty of clients now that are over eighty, and honestly, they they don't spend that much in at that stage. They've done their travel, you know. They 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 like small trips, you know, around Australia to meet family or friends. They they don't spend a fortune. So, you know, people still have this big fear of the costs. Now, I I do believe aged care will become more self funded, but even at the moment with the the caps that are on the fees, it you're never going to spend all your money on aged care it's you know there are capped fees and you, you're going to retain most of your your wealth and um, that will change over time but for the moment um i think people just need to understand that what they spend in their 60s you know they can spend a little bit more then because they're, they're not going to spend as much later on in life and a lot of people are looking to help children we just say look you've got to take care of you first before you start looking at jumping and giving lump sums to other family members because a lot of them, when they get access to their pensions and the access to that superannuation pool, it can be sort of all, oh, you know, we've got suddenly we've got all this money. What what we can do? Can we do with it? And you know, with most people, they start thinking about their children. But you can spend, you know, average life expectancy for a female now is eighty seven, a male eighty four. That's just the average. So fifty percent more of those people are going to live well, probably well into their nineties. Uh, retiring at 60, 65, that's you know, 30, 35 years in retirement. It's as long as your your working career. Yeah, well, that's right with uh, life expectancy now. And and, and look, I, I was curious with your comment um, about, let's call it the Australian system for, well, one, for the age pension and, and two, for age care. Um, the system has got a lot of, I suppose, a lot of protection in it for the client not to spend all of their money before, you know, they die. Um, so, you know, that can give them a lot of comfort as well that they've, we've got those provisions in Australia to catch them um, down the track as well. Yeah, certainly that that sweet spot of, you know, having, say, you know, 600 to a million dollars between you and your wife uh, knowing that as that drops below the 954 you know, assets test, then you start replacing uh, income then from your investments with income from the age pension. Um, and that, you know, it means that once you do start, that starts happening, you end up eating into your capital at a much slower rate at that stage. So, you know, when you, you, you spend some of your, your capital, it gets replaced to a degree by by a steady income stream from Centrelink, and just making people understand that interplay. That you know, and we saw it over the last four years that somebody with you know one point two million dollars was often in a worse position than somebody who was on had six hundred or seven hundred thousand, because you were you were earning one or two percent maximum on term deposits, where somebody on on the IH pension was getting a really good income stream. Um, for that gap they had between the the, the cut assets cut off test and what they actually had, so it the, you know it's a case of it's not always a bad thing to be spending money because you're it's going to be replaced by that that safety net that comes in from the uh, from the age pension. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and oh, I think circling into the theme of permission, it's it's giving them permission to invest over the long term and. Um, and access, let's call it dividends from shares or ETFs, um, and and having the conversations with them about well volatility really, and not necessarily risk. There is risk as part of that, um, but volatility is the real conversation as well. If I if I circle back to um, clients and and working around purpose and those that are struggling to transition into retirement after their long working life. What are what are some of the things that um, I mean? You mentioned earlier about teaching your client French, but I suppose if we speak a bit more generally, how, how can we help those that are struggling to transition into retirement after you know a long working life? Well, I encourage people to to look at what the people before them have done. You know, talk to colleagues who have retired, 
and just said, look, look, how did you manage after retirement? What, did, you know, what are the things you were interested in doing and what did you do and what were the struggles? The problem is I know that most of my female clients all are already talking and I've talked to, to their friends about this. But what I see with my, my male clients is that they just haven't done that and they, they, they're just trying to sort things out themselves without without asking. So in a lot of cases, I just wish there was more forums and more, and, and I think what I do find is there's a lot of Facebook community forums now. You know, in the local area where I, I am, there's dads in the hills. Um, and basically, you know, people just throw in ideas there of what they do and, you know, what should I do for a new career or a part-time career or retirement? And, you know, you get the, the input from people who've been there before you. So I think for a lot of a lot of my clients, what I try and do is if I see that they're struggling or see that, they, you know, that they just don't have some purposes, just trying to find something that, that will excite them and give them ideas. Um, and, you know, we have a lot of people who just are not very good at, at social interaction. Um, and it's a matter of just finding a way for them to find their people, to find a group that suits their needs. So we had we had one group of, of gentlemen who's absolutely no interest whatsoever in sport, no interest whatsoever in tools and everything like that. But he found a group of, of 10 blokes and all they do is they meet every month for just a, a, a meal and they have a good red wine and they just have a chat about life. Um, and out of that, he's met, he's, he's met some guys that they, they do some other things together for one of the charities. So, and they, they each bring in ideas and just say, like, is there anybody who would, would like to be part of this? I'm doing this for with, with such and such a group. We need a couple of volunteers. Um, and, and that's great. That gets them talking. Um, it's just something that I, I really find blokes struggle with is, you know, is getting ideas. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. That's, that's also my experience. I, I think, call it through this baby boomer generation, um, part culturally was the men went to work full time and, and the women, and I know this is a generalization for that, uh, this era, um, but it's part of what we're talking about today is the the men have just been thinking about working all their life and um, and they get a lot of, I suppose, their interactions through their work life and, and the women over time have spent more time with friends and females and males as well um, having conversations about lots of things that's not work-related and they're, they're much better prepared um, for that transition to retirement. And I think potentially in the future, Liam, if I sort of come off the back end of that, uh, uh, the culture, like I'm 46, I think those around my age and younger, uh, the wives or the females, um, not necessarily the wives, but females are working full-time now. And this is probably going to be an issue for them in the future, being those full-time workers and, and not exposing themselves to as much time away from work either. I think that's something that, the the, the the types of conversations we'll have in the future as well with with female clients. Yeah, and uh, look, it, it can happen to anybody. It's just that we see it more with men. But you know, one of my female clients, she was a really active person. Um, but then when she got into to her sixties, she found she honestly found that most of the people her age group were were boring, and she wanted to be more active. Well, in the end, she picked up a camera and she started doing graphic design and stuff like that. But now she's ended up being one of the best yachting photographers in the country she's she goes out on, on the yachts takes during the competitions she takes live action photographs through all of them comes back and you know puts those all on the websites for the for the the different um groups and she just she it's her passion now so something that she just thought she would try the graphic design side of it did her course on that and that led her to photography and she's just found that passion for the last five seven years that's just what she just absorbs herself with, and she's brilliant at it. Yeah, that's that's awesome stuff as well. We, um, for us, we we focus a lot with our clients in that pre five years, maybe even pre ten years prior to retirement, of digging really deep and encourage them to take those trips while still working and using up their long service leave through those periods whilst working. And, you know, taking those trips to discover if that's what they really want in their retirement, you know, that type of travel, you know, I'm sure you've had um, experiences where where clients have bought a caravan the day they retired, uh, taken their first trip and then put their caravan on the market. So 
Uh, and I think it's really important to, in the lead up, to test things out. And I think you've also mentioned that too, Lamb, and you've had experience with that as well. Yeah, look, it, it, the try before you buy, it, it, it works for retirement in using the transition to retirement. But also things like if you're looking at a, a caravan, maybe go on to Camplify or hire a motor home and try one. Um, I have had people who've bought the Winnebago, you know, set off on a trip around the country and then phone me up and go, oh my God, we hate it. We absolutely hate it. Um, I had clients who moved out, they wanted to move down to Barrow and Mossvale area. They thought they were going to travel in their caravan all around the country. So they 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 just like, they took the advice and rented first down in, in Mossvale um, happened to rent a big property with a big uh, garden. You know, so when they did go traveling in the caravan, found they didn't like it. But what they did love was the, the big garden, which they never thought they would have in retirement. And so they flipped their retirement totally, got rid of the caravan, and they bought the house they were renting. It's got about an acre of gardens. And they they both spend most of their time taking care of roses. And, you know, they, the, the actual gardens look absolutely beautiful. So it's a, a pleasure to go and see them. But it's also a pleasure to go down and see that they found what they love doing in retirement. And they hadn't, they hadn't suffered from buying a townhouse or a villa and suddenly discovering that they needed to move to get what they wanted in a, you know, with a garden. So with most of my clients now, I ask them, especially if they're moving out of Sydney, if whether it's the central coast or to you know to the out, out west, try it for three, six months, or even go on Airbnbs for one or two weeks at a time in, in the, the high season, in the low season. Because what we do find is a lot of people who want to retire to their favorite holiday place, well, it, it might have been their ideal holiday place you know, for one week or two weeks of the year, but 52 weeks of the year in a in 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 some of those areas is just it, it's not a great lifestyle. There's not great access to healthcare. They're having to come back down to Sydney to see specialists, and they they can't even find bulk billing doctors or or even a doctor in a lot of those areas. They're so booked out. So you know, it's a matter of try before you buy, and and make sure that you don't make the big costly mistakes because stamp duty on a, a million dollar home. Is, is very expensive. And if you have to do it one or two times because things don't work out, that can really hurt your budget. Yeah, absolutely it can. And that certainly impacts the capital that you have available to support your income needs um, throughout your retirement. Um, and, and one thing to speak about as well, we, we've had clients and we've talked about their holiday houses that they 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 bought along their journey and their... Um, you know, their vision for that holiday house. And I come back to what you're talking about, which is uh, needs for services as well. Um, we've had many clients who have sold their holiday houses to use the term to liquidate those funds and invest them. So they had that flexibility to actually go and travel to new and unique places because the holiday home that they knew is not the holiday home they wanted retirement as well. Yeah. And also they have this dream of they'd be at the holiday house and all the grandchildren would come up and they would stay the weekends and, you know, it would all be great. And then you discover that, well, no, they got their sports on the weekend or their ballet on the weekend. Um, and they just, you know, the house gets used five or six times during the year. So with a lot of our clients have done exactly that. They've sold the, the holiday house. They've invested some of the money. And then what they do is they take the family on a trip to different places, a different place each year. And they can have their cabin and the family can have their cabin. So at the end of the night, they peace and quiet, they go back into their own, um, their own rooms and it just works out much better than you know I, I did have a client up in Port Stevens who you know they bought a, a double story house and then they were told their grandkids weren't coming up because there was no pool there so they thought about putting in a pool and then we looked at them going you know one the double story house wasn't working because both of them had issues with their, their knees um, and they had no interest whatsoever in putting a pool in so in the end, they've downsized to a villa and saved themselves a fortune. And now each year they spend about ten to 12000 They take the family away to a different big four caravan park around the country and have a great time um, with no responsibilities of taking care of the pool for 52 weeks of the year. And that's right. All the capital that was required to put that pool in um, has, has definitely preserved their retirement uh, capital as well. Um, for income purposes, and I, I think that's something that we work through with clients together, and they get they get great satisfaction out of the interaction with their family. Of where will we go this year? We're paying. We've you know we're in good shape. We've we've pulled some capital out of that 
uh, holiday home, um, and they go off and have new experiences as well, which which seems to, you know, really satisfying for the grandparents, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it, again, I go back to, it, but it gives I get most of the grandfathers, you know, the the grandfather to actually do the planning. That's his challenge, and they start, you know, yeah. they start finding finding even more quirky places to stay that they know their grand, you know, their grandkids will love, and it, it becomes a, a family you know, a, a tradition. And that's what you want to build up. You want to build up experiences, memories, because giving your grandkids, you know, a, a new iPad or a new uh, PlayStation, they, they won't remember it. But you take them away to, you know, Northern Territory or you take them up to, to Outback Queensland for a, a week or, you know, just to a coastal place where they have memories of on the beach and barbecues on the beach. Those memories stick with people for the rest of their lives. So I really focus on saying to clients, don't be afraid to spend money on experiences rather than things. I really love that. And I want to talk a little bit more about how you focus on getting the, the grandpa to organize these events. And I, I think there was a key word for, for me there, which is in a way it, it forces grandpa to be connected with everybody. And, and it creates a level of connection and communication that's on a, you know, a deeper level because they've got to interact with all of this decision-making and, and give me your feedback on that from your clients of how that plays out for them. Yeah, well, look, it's it's the old traditional thing where a, a mother will talk to her daughter on the phone for an hour or she'll talk to her fourth for two minutes because um, men just are not traditionally great uh, on the phone. Um, so what I did find in, with a lot of retiree clients is that all the communication ended up going through the mum. So, you know, how, if you ask how the family's going, the, the husband would just turn around to his wife and go, well, you tell him. And I'd say, well, you know, have you ever been away with them? Have you seen them? Oh, we've gone down for one day or gone down two days. Whereas when the grandfather has to plan a trip, he's got to take everybody's needs and their their own sort of quirkinesses into into consideration and actually has to be in touch with them, organizing that, you know, what time is of the year is the right time or where where they can go. Um, and they're actually talking to their grandchildren, talking to their own children, and that is it develops the relationship. Um, it you know sometimes if it, it can cause issues, but you'd rather somebody was actually talking to their children than just letting it all go through the the, you know, the, the partner. Yeah, absolutely. I I attended a conference about ten years ago now, and um, one of the presenters at that conference was a doctor uh, in the in the psychology field. And the doctor, it was a really great presentation, but one thing that stuck with me so I had good knowledge on this was the doctor explained that women, they've done studies and measurements, women will speak approximately, I think it was 30,000 words a day and men will speak 10. And that's just on a study and and women will communicate their way through things a, a lot better than men. But but for me, that was a bit of an aha moment to to make sure in meetings that I explored enough information from the males in the meeting um and i think that circles back to what you were talking about there getting grandpa involved in organizing things it, it pushes him to communicate more yeah look i do get some pushback initially from some clients when you start asking personal questions about your lifestyle and things like that um because men are just you know they're not naturally open to sharing it they came in to get financial advice from me what am I doing talking about where they're going on holidays and you know who they're taking on holidays? But after the first couple of years, you know the relationship builds, and that becomes probably the main thing we talk about in their in their review appointments, rather than just focusing on investment performance. Um, they're not going to be able to affect investment performance. I don't claim to be an investment guru. What I want to do is make sure they have the most enjoyable you know, retirement as possible. And, you know, with my new business, we, you know, we have a little tagline, create, enjoy, and transfer. Create the wealth and do a good foundation for your retirement, but then actually enjoy it, to, you know, have a balance in life, not just in retirement, but before it, enjoying your wealth, enjoying the, the, the fruits of your labor, and then transferring some of that wealth, whether it be through estate planning or more and more often now, it's it's happening younger uh, while people are alive because if they're dying in their 90s, their kids are in their 60s, when they're inheriting. So most people want to help out their, their children and more so their grandchildren now. So a lot of it's about, you know, working with them on intergenerational transfer now rather than waiting and just doing it through estate planning. So I have a number of, of grandfathers where what they'll do is 
we set up dollar for dollar matching with their as their grandchildren start working, they'll they'll just promote with them, you know, getting them used to putting some money away and saving. Um, and you know, we we use the first home super saver scheme for for people, and we just say, you know, if you sell your sacrifice two dollars into that, your grandfather's going to give you a dollar back, and the grandfathers run that that with them and keep them accountable to it as well. And I find they actually they'll, they'll put more in as a bonus just when they see the kids have done something good, like you know, passed the job or you know, done their um, got their B plates or whatever. And it's just a, it's a great step on just training that next generation about the value of money, because I, I I get a lot of grandparents talking about not wanting to spoil a generation by giving them too much money too easy. Well, the the best way you can do it is by educating them on how to value and appreciate money along the way, rather than just leaving them a big lump sum in in an estate plan. Yeah, I think that's a, a great approach, um, Liam, for for how to, I suppose, teach the next generations of, um, you know, of through your through your family tree um, of, of how to accumulate money yourself first and, and how to use money well over time. We, um, look, we experienced something similar and, and we have conversations with our clients. It's, I suppose it's about the financial planning piece and, the, and their understanding of their assets and their cash flow and if they have excess assets, and then you get to a point where you recognize that they've got too many assets and let's call it in their mid sixties, early, late sixties, early seventies. Um, and we have a saying that we say to clients when we have established that is, um, you know, let's have a conversation about your estate, which you're always talking about anyway, right? That's part of our, our role and our responsibility and having their estate planning wills in place. Um, we talk to clients at that point about, would you prefer to give with a warm hand now or a cold heart? So it's the ability for them to to share that wealth in some ways to you know get some enjoyment out of that wealth flowing through their their family tree as well. Um, so that's look that's that's one thing that we do talk about a lot as well. And there's great um, opportunities in that as well because you know. We, we talked earlier about not having to, to do everything together in retirement. So one of the things we try and push with some of the, the, the grandparents is when your granddaughter hits 18 or your grandson hits 18, go on a grandmother, granddaughter weekend away. Or you know, I've, I've had one who's yeah. taken grand, granddaughter to Paris. Her husband was never interested. Her granddaughter was just blown away by the idea of getting to Paris at 18. They They saw everything. But at the same time, the grandfather took the 16-year-old away to Bathurst and they did the whole uh, you know, sporting weekend, motoring weekend. Um, you know, everybody was happy. But it, it's it's getting spending spending time and experiences with your children and grandchildren rather than just paying for the next car or paying for school fees or, or things like that. It's about giving them the experience that build their character and build their resilience. Because they're probably going to go through ten or fifteen careers, in the you know their their financial life is probably not going to be as steady as you know what most of us have experienced. Um, so by giving them that that ability to manage money, manage tough times, manage good times, um, understanding you know an investment that promises fifty percent is probably you know just as likely to lose fifty percent. So you know teaching them the, the value of money and the value of doing research on stuff is really important. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think a bit of a theme that I've, I've sensed coming through in our, our chat today and is um, one word is permission and one word is purpose. And, and really it's how those tie together. And if we, if we go back to someone leading into retirement, um, they're seeking purpose or a new purpose for their life. But I, I also think that they are seeking permission from from us as the planner, from their spouses, from their children, from their family. Um, and so I think there's a big linkage between uh, the purpose, the new purpose they're looking for and and getting that permission. Uh, talk to me about how you see that linkage, Len. Yeah, well, look, I, I think with the, with the purpose, the big problem is a lot of people don't haven't thought about what happens in retirement. So the purpose is really up to it's either their their partner or their financial advisor or somebody has to raise that issue with them at least 
you know, a couple of years or, or hopefully five years out from retirement about, look, what are, what are you going to do in retirement? You know, I, I, I know most, most blogs I talk to haven't really thought about it past, you know, the first year of retirement. Um, the ones who actually sit down and think about it, they actually make great plans for what they want to do. So it's just giving that, giving somebody, and, and you know, I would imagine you talk to 70% of guys, if you said, what's your purpose in life, they would, they'd go blank on you. But if you actually say, look, I want you now to plan for what you're going to do in retirement, I come back to me at the next review with some ideas and we can start working, if, you know, working that into your budget for retirement so that you don't worry about the financial side of it. And that you, you know, and then you, know, your wife can also plan her, her what she will do in retirement, and um, and so that little bit of extra planning, one, it eases the the move into retirement, the fear of cutting off from work, suddenly is dissipated because they've actually got a plan in place, and two, it, it's 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 a more enjoyable because it is a stressful time, giving up that regular pay, regular salary, to move into retirement and start eating into your nest egg. If they've got a purpose in life to, and things to do, then the, the second part of that is the permission. If they come back with those ideas and we work through it and go, well, you know, that's that's not it's not such a crazy idea to spend 120000 on a on a unit, a small little unit to, to hold your, your car and your, on your mechanics tools. It keeps them away from the house where it'll drive your wife mad having parts of cars sitting around the place. Um, or, you know, I've, I've had it where we've agreed to put on a little small extension onto the house and made it into an art room for the, for the, the wife. Um, um, well, actually, it was for the husband. I mean, he did um, lead glass, you know, the uh, window panes where you do the, the lead different down colours. Um, you know, that went from somebody who was doing a, a very mundane job day to day in retirement. Now he's actually making and selling those and doing art at uh, weekly, you know, uh, markets around the, the area where they live up in the Hunter Valley. So it's it's really, but he, he they, they never thought they could afford to do something like that. But it actually added value to their home and made the home a lot more easy to, to use because they weren't leaving their stuff around the place. It just went into the art room and it worked perfectly. But if he hadn't, he would, I know he would have just gone into retirement and he probably would never have followed that passion unless he had that space to actually do it in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but just another another example of, of how to find purpose in retirement. I'll, I'll go back to we were talking about, and look, we've, we've spoken in the context of, of males and females. I got to break that down and, and talk about um, in the context of the breadwinner and the non-breadwinner or, or the supporter to the breadwinner. Um, and I think this is a, a bit of a, a critical thing to work through with with clients. Uh, the breadwinner's focus has been to be the breadwinner, to be the provider, to be the provider of money um, and have a steady flow of that money coming in each week, each fortnight, each month um, to cover the things that they've wanted to do through their accumulation phase. I, I find the breadwinner has the hardest transition because they're moving from a, a position of well, I suppose, of delivering something pretty significant to their family unit to, okay, I'm not needed for that anymore. Show me how we're going to do it. And and am I still going to be needed? Now, do you know what I mean when I say that, Liam? Look, that that's a really tough part for the breadwinner, isn't it? Yeah, because at the same time, they're giving up their job. So they're losing that that uh, sense of me you know, being in control of my job and then me being the deliverer of the money to the family. And so you know, we really talk about that's where the budgeting, that's where the idea of setting a budget in retirement and then knowing what's going to be there to spend, what the, the pensions are going to be coming through, if there's age pension, what that's going to be like. It's making sure that they know because one of the big things I've seen over the last 10 years is when a, a breadwinner loses, somebody who's been in control of the money and, and you know, working full time, when they lose their job through retrenchment or illness or you know, for some reason they've had to retire early. They they really struggle, and uh, we a lot of them go to the extreme then of trying to control the money down to minute lines. So they start running the household budget as if they were running the the business that they've been in previously. So they start you know they we call it spreadsheetitis. It's where they everything goes into a spreadsheet. You know, I don't, I remember one case where 
what one of the uh, a female client came into a meeting and she said, my husband went through my purse to pull out all the receipts and he found my you know, where I got my nails done and he went on the internet and he came back to me and he said, oh, there's a better place, cheaper, you know, just down the road that she should go to. She said, I don't want him telling me where to get my nails done. But he thought he was doing the right thing by the family, finding a cheaper, you know, service for her. Um, and he just, you know, it was driving a wage between them because he was just trying to control everything down to that minute level of detail that just didn't work. And he honestly didn't think he was doing anything wrong. He thought he was doing the right thing by the family. But that, that could have veered on, you know, control. After, you know, it was becoming a control issue. So in the end, we have their family budget. We have the his spends and we have her spends. There is no argument about what she spends her spends on, and she doesn't argue about what he spends his spends on. So it's really about making sure that you have those clear you know, delineations of of you know, what the what the budget is for and who controls it, um, and and not you know not getting yourself into such uh, you know wrapped up completely in in what you're spending in retirement. It's it's meant to be about enjoying life and enjoying. Your time after having worked all your career, not not a time to to be worried about where twenty pen or twenty cents gets sent. Yeah, I I agree with that um, totally. That it's really important to well, I think for us it, the first thing we do, and this helps build purpose on the back of that, is let's work through what you spent in the last twelve months. Let's look at it moving forward. What that would look like. Um, and look, we all have great budgeting tools that we use. We use the term spending planner. We like it to be forward looking. So they're mapping it out. Um, but there is two key elements in that as we work through it with the, with the, with the couple and it's, it has some similar similarities to you, Liam, and we have two lines on the budget and it's called don't ask money husband, don't ask money wife, and it's don't ask money. So a bit similar to. So what you're talking about there, um, having the don't ask money allocation, it just removes a ton of friction, right? And, and everyone's signed off on it and agreed to it. Yeah. And the, the, the thing is, if a lot of people, while they're working, they don't, they don't budget at all. They just work off, I've got my salary come in. We know the expenses for the family are X. At the end of the end of the month, we've either got a little bit left over or we've eaten into our, our savings a little bit. But in retirement, it sort of becomes much more of a focus about eating into their capital. So you really do have to, you know, with just something similar, like you talk about budgeting tools, we just start off simple, just say, look, use the, the My Budget Planner from uh, Money Smart, the government's one. Sit down with the last you know, three to six months of um, debit cards and credit cards and just put that in there so you actually know what you spend at the moment. And then look at the Asphalt Retirement Survey. You know, they've got the average that a couple spends in, in Sydney and it breaks down their budget. I just say to them, look, these are the things you can expect to spend in in retirement. Go through it and see if there's things that you for you for you, you want to spend extra, and put them in there as you know the the don't ask him and the don't ask her, um, so that there there aren't surprises, you know. And it, but it, you you will find that a lot of people, the idea of sitting down and actually going through what they spend, is is really difficult for them because they they they're afraid of what the answer is going to be. Yeah, absolutely. And and, and from a, our perspective, the don't ask money, it's mandatory. We go through that um, with each client and we, and we talk about that there could be the, the husband or the wife will, let's let's assume for a moment it's $100 a week per, per husband, per wife. And the wife may not be a spender and over the course of 20 weeks, she may accumulate $2,000 and buy the husband or the grandkids something really, really nice that's really important to her. Or vice versa, and, and we have that conversation um, in the meetings. However, it's don't ask money, right? So yeah. you make the call on what you spend it on. And you grandmothers will always have a, a grandkids budget. You know, they're 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 always the ones who take care of birthday presents. They're always the ones that you know they know when a special occasion is coming up for them. So they they will they will always have been putting money away. Um, what we do with with the blokes, it's they pay for the big things. They tend, you know, they tend to take responsibility for those, but and it's only once they retire and start looking at their budget, they realise how much, you know, their wives have actually managed money over the years and budgeted to to cover those things like birthday presents and and you know and days out and stuff. Right. And suddenly, they, there's a lot more respect for what the wife has done. 
during that over that period. And then they've probably both worked full time jobs as well. <laughs> yeah, the, the the person who doesn't manage the budget in accumulation phase uh, has some real aha moments when they start to have a full awareness of you know how that's been managed over time, and they're going to be part of the future journey, don't they? Yeah, definitely. Um, Liam, today in our episode, we have spoken about um, purpose in retirement, and and I hope we brought some great value to the listeners today. In we, we've moved around in di- many different areas, um, and the two key phrases for me were permission and purpose. Um, making sure our job as the the advisor is to uncover what they want and and, and help give them the permissions. So they can, you know, move forward into their future retirement life with purpose. Um, and for me, that was definitely our theme for today, and and um, what I've taken out of today. Have you got some final comments before we we close off today's podcast? Yeah, all I'd say is, as an advisor, don't just suddenly change the way you do things. Yeah, you know, if it's something you haven't addressed before, ease into it with clients. As I said, you'll get pushback to start with if you've been just focused on strategies and investments and you suddenly start talking about personal things, you may find that the clients push back. So introduce it by you know, having, as I said, that little book that I, I give to people is great. Just find things that you can give to people about planning for retirement and to start that conversation. And then you can develop it from there. But don't try to don't try to just hold us, pull us, start, oh, I'm suddenly going to be a lifestyle planner because it, it's going to come across very badly with, with clients. Just ease into the conversation test the water with your clients. In some cases, you may have to have conversations with them separately to address issues before you bring them together to talk about the the actual retirement budgeting. Yeah, and I I think it's really important if you're going to move more into that area is to, um, you know, position it and seek permission to ask those types of questions as well. Definitely. Liam Short, Thank you for your contribution today. We've had a great chat uh, and I think we've brought some great value to our listeners. And, um, and thanks again and have a great day. Thank you very much.